make that our prayer today. God, all over again, we give ourselves to you, O oh Lord. the name of the Lord. What a privilege to be in the presence of the Lord and, and just to be in a place where we can experience his will and purpose. God bless you. You may be seated and what a delight to see each one of you here uh, on this evening as we begin our missions weekend. God has been so good to this church and I really do see in our uh, history uh, how important missions has been and continues to be. And I'm so thankful for each one of you uh, that have caught that vision and made missions a part of your walk with the Lord. And I uh, thank God for you being here tonight. I do want to say, I don't know if I see, there's Brother Mike McBride. 
and Brother Herman, I don't know, but these men and those that work with them, gentlemen, didn't they do a great job last night? That was awesome. There was so much food. I didn't think we could have that much food without any ladies present, but we found a way to get you ladies to make it ahead of time. But And then all of the, the ribs and barbecue, we had over 70 men that joined us last night. That was awesome. We're thankful. And several were guests to Heaven View. No connection other than you men that brought them. And it was a wonderful time of food and fun and fellowship, but it was a lot of work. And I thank you, Brother uh, Mike and Brother Herman and others I know tremendous and it was great but I think that speaks to who we are at heaven view even in the words of that song I give myself away the kingdom of God demands that we make a decision am I going to live for myself or am I going to live for him and once you lock that in it really is amazing how many opportunities God gives you to give yourself away and I just don't know if you ever regret giving yourself to the cause of the kingdom of God. I, I haven't come across uh, that in my own life. And uh, there's one translation of 2 Corinthians 8. I want to read it from this translation because it makes it so simple. It speaks of giving and missions giving as what we're focusing on this weekend. But it's bigger than that. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1 now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor. Anybody ever had troubles? Anybody ever been poor? Anybody still poor? Anybody ever still in trouble? Sure, this is us right here. This is us right here. He said, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. That's us too, right there. We have troubles, we experience poverty, but we are overflowing in joy, in generosity. And, and he says something here so powerful, verse 3, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. So one church having an opportunity to help another church, one a particular area reaching out to help another area. That's what we're all about around here. But then he gives the secret to how they were able to do it in verse 5. They even did more than we had hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. And that's heaven view. After so many years that I have had a small part in what God is doing here, I'm convinced that that's you and I tonight. That when you give yourself to the Lord first, then all the other giving flows out of that. And I honor each one of you for learning how to give yourself to the Lord. And because you have given, the old song says, thank you for giving to the Lord. And I'll change it up a little bit. So many lives have been changed because you are a giver. And that's why we're singing, my life is not my own. I live for you alone. I give myself, I give myself away. And obviously it's money, but it's more than money, it's ministry. You're serving, teaching, preaching, leading, everything that you're doing, whether it's in a life group or a Sunday or Wednesday service or a special event, what is that all about? I give myself, I give myself to you, Lord. We talk about places where we partner, and so many of you, as I mentioned these names, you are actively involved in helping and serving in places like Mayaden, Denton, 
Moxville, Statesville, Taylorsville, King, and if we have anything left, we try to help out in Winston-Salem. What is that all about? I give myself away. Once you've given yourself to the Lord, it's really not that difficult to give away time and talent and money. Isn't it awesome to be a part of the kingdom of God? And that's what this weekend is all about. I wanted to just say just briefly, because sometimes we do not think about it in these terms. Right now in Alexander County, 36,000 people, and there's only one United Pentecostal Church. It happens to be in Taylorsville, where Pastor Chris leads several of you. I say that's what giving ourselves away is all about. So 36,000 people would at least have one choice, one chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Recently, we've become a little bit more engaged in what God is doing in King. In Stokes County, over 44,000 people and only one United Pentecostal Church. That's the Apostolic Church of King. Brother Everhart, we're coming for you. We're not going to make you do it all by yourself because we've already given ourselves to the Lord. So why don't we give ourselves to this need? Praise God. And of course, here in Winston-Salem, they're telling us 250,000 people. We thank God for the work of the Spanish-speaking United Pentecostal Church. But I think English people, people that speak English, ought to know about Jesus Christ. And so we gather here Wednesday, Sunday, other special events. But can we remember today, this is about souls. Whether it's souls in Winston-Salem or souls around the world, including Djibouti. People need the Lord. Can you say amen? And so it is more than money, it's ministry. But you know it's more than ministry, it's money. And so many of you have been so faithful. One year ago, God spake to us. He said, if you will fill these little baskets with a lot of sacrifice, I will feel a much bigger building with a lot more souls that need the Lord. I still remember when God shared that with me. And I am amazed to report to you today from that time until then, from April 2022 until April 2023, we have filled these baskets with $499,000, a little bit more, $499,780.63. Hey, when you give yourself to the Lord, everything else follows. Can you just say as you clap your hands, to God be the glory, to God be the glory. Hallelujah. number is a major miracle for a church our size and what I consider even more wonderful is that while we were answering the call of God as it relates to this building we did not want our missions to suffer and we've tried over many years to make sure we were giving at least a hundred thousand dollars or more to missions since that same time april 1st 2022 until now not counting move the mission or christmas for christ not counting what you give to ladies ministries or to sunday school or to apostolic man or all of that just to global missions in the last year you have given 143 $3,534. That's awesome. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. And so here we are a year later, and we're just saying, God, I just want to go on record. I give myself away. I give myself away today, tomorrow. It's really not about money. It's about saying, Lord, first, I give myself to you. To ministry, to money, yes, but to you first and foremost. And whatever you want to do with my life, I want to say yes to you. Is there anybody that feels that way? 
Praise God. One more time in your own words, could you say, I give myself to you, Lord. I give my heart to you, Lord. I give my life to you, Lord. I give my talent to you, Lord. I give my money to you, Lord. But more than anything, I give myself to you, Lord. I give myself to you, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Heaven View. Thank you, each one of you, for being such generous people with your time, with your talent, with your treasure, with your finances, with your faith. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And we are so honored to have brother and sister Abernathy with us, veteran missionaries now retired, spending, believe it or not, 40 years ministering in Africa, South Africa, Malawi, and then I think for over 20 years in Zambia. I know this couple uh, fairly well, and a few years ago they started talking about retirement, and my first response internally was, that's ridiculous. I had been to Zambia before, I had seen their influence, their impact, and I thought there's no way that they're ready for retirement. And then when I heard 40 years, I thought, well, maybe they're older than they look, at least he is. I don't know that Sister Abernathy will ever get old, but I think it speaks so highly of their commitment to give themselves away that 40 years later, they can look at a continent that was not their own, they could look at a nation that was not their own, and having walked away from family and friends and the comforts that we enjoy every day, I don't believe you will hear in their voices today one single solitary regret for saying 40 years ago we gave ourselves away and every year following we have said yes to the call of God. That's why they are here this weekend because for many of us that are getting a little bit older, for many of us that have been through a lot of these services and a lot of these weekends, I want you to think about a couple of words that we don't always think about, and some of the young people will not even think about them when I say them now. Those words are longevity and legacy. At some point in your life, you realize only what's done for the kingdom of God is going to matter one breath into eternity. And this precious couple stands as an example, 40 years of giving their life to the call of God and no regrets today. We just want to be what God wants us to be. We are honored to have the Abernathy's with us here at Heaven View. Thank you for everything you represent, for sharing with us. And so first, you're going to hear from Sister Abernathy. She said she's not a preacher, but she's going to share. After she's done sharing, you're going to say, I think she's a preacher. <laughs> but she's just going to share. And then he's going to come, and he's going to share. And all the way through, we're going to thank God for what we are a part of. Amen. We are an extension of them. And if you have been faithful, like so many of you have, to giving and praying for missionaries, they are an extension of us. Would you stand and welcome the Abernathy? She's going to come first, followed by him. Aren't we thankful for our missionaries, what they represent? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much to Pastor Linder and this congregation. And as we were singing the song, I remembered seeing Brother Robert Linder singing that song for a graduation in Zambia for students that were graduating. And he sang that song, I Give Myself Away. And the presence of God moved into that building. And I saw young people that were tinkering on the edge, not knowing what they were going to do, and God called them, and they are in ministry today. So I'm very thankful for all that God has done. We love this church. We love Brother Linder. He's like my, he can't possibly be my son, <laughs> but he was my son, and I am so thankful for both Brother and Sister Linder. We have watched Harrison and, and uh, Abby grow up 
through pictures and Facebook, and he always had plenty of pictures to share when he came. He actually has come six times to Zambia and the 22 years that we were in Zambia, and the Zambians love him. And we thank you as the congregation and Sister Linder for sharing your husband and sharing your pastor because he was such a great, great inspiration to us. And in those, we actually had 19 uh, or 2021 would have been our 40 years of appointment. We were appointed in 1981, April 5, 1981. We were just very young. Kids didn't know what we were doing. But one thing that I remember, Brother Linder, we knew God had called us. And if God calls you, there is nothing that can stand against you because he knows all things. He knows where you're going. He knows where you are today. He knows where we are today. And um, I thought about that, that, and I will say, um, when my husband first approached me, and asked me if before we were even engaged, he said, so what do you think about maybe if uh, we go to Africa one day? And I'm looking at him, 19 years old, you know, but I really loved him. <laughs> so I'm thinking, sure, whatever, you know, yeah, I'll go to Africa. Africa is a, it's a big place, isn't it? So I said, sure, but reality is, <laughs> Once we were engaged, once we were married, I'm like, no, baby, I don't want to go to Africa. I have no desire. You know, we can do home missions work here. We can pastor. We can do something, anything but Africa. And he was such a gentleman. You know, God is a gentleman. God will not force you to do anything unless you yield yourself to him and give yourself away. But he did not force me, but ever so often my, our son, at that time we only had the one, we do have two, and one of them is my, our pastor. My youngest son was 10 months old when we were appointed as missionaries, and he is now our pastor. I mean, you talk about strange. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about seasons of your life being flipped and you're like, okay, okay. But you know what? God has been good to us and he is a great pastor. And every time I see him, I think of him on deputation, worshiping God. And I know that God had it all in control. Amen. But he was so kind to me and it was in a prayer room that the Lord finally showed me that I needed to yield to his spirit. And the Lord reminded me, I received the Holy Ghost when I was 14 years old. And during that prayer meeting, I was expecting our second child and he was ready to go, but our pastor at that time, Reverend David Hudson was so kind and he wasn't pushing, but he knew God was going to direct. And whenever I was in that prayer room, the Lord began to speak to me and he said, do you remember what you asked me for after you got the Holy Ghost? And I couldn't remember and I thought, and he reminded me, I, young people hear me, because if you ask God for something, God doesn't forget. God remembers. And so the, 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 the voice that, it wasn't an audible voice, but it came to me and the, he said, you asked me to be a missionary's wife or an evangelist's wife. And I now have presented you with the opportunity to be a missionary wife. And I, oh God, you know how you do. Oh God, when you speak, that's exactly what I'm gonna do, Lord, I, I'll do whatever. But then we had an awesome thing happen. We got to headquarters for our meeting and there was another couple there that had applied for the same country that we had applied for. And they came to us and they said, you know, in the store, when PP, when our publishing house was there in the building, and they said, oh, you know, we've applied for South Africa too. Well, they were pastoring. We had never pastored when we went to the mission field. And so I was like, okay, God, this is great. 
They'll be appointed. We still have some more time, so I won't have to go to the mission field right away. And then when we were appointed, and Brother Freeman, E.L. Freeman, if you are older, you remember the Freemans. Brother E.L. Freeman called us and told us that we were appointed as missionaries and that we would begin our deputation in two months. We had two months to get ready to start deputizing. And when, when he came, or when he said that, my husband said, well, we're like associate missionaries, aren't we, you know, working? And he said, no, sir, unless you've killed somebody that we don't know about, you're fully fledged missionaries and so we were like okay so God knows the end from the beginning he knows exactly where you're going to be and I can truly say I am not sorry being a global missionary for us was probably the highlight of our life and now as David said we were young now we are old, but we've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread, because God knows all about us. God knows what we can do. God knows what we cannot do. And when we cannot do something, God gives us a team that we're able to work and do. And so that I, I, I just said all of that to say, you are an awesome team. You are a team who has an awesome leader, top leader, and then God above all things. To be a team, you know, Harry, uh, Harry Ford or Henry Ford said, coming together is a beginning, but keeping together is progress. And working together is success. And that is what teams are about. Brother Abernathy and I have always served as a team. We work together. And I think that is probably one of the things that we try to emphasize on the field. We're a team. No matter what, we're a team. Husbands and wives are teams. When we first got to Africa, men sat on one side of the church and women on the other side of the church. Now they still do that, except for one meeting. And that was the meeting that Brother uh, Linder and Brother Robert Linder were at in 2019 is our pastors and our wives meeting. And in that meeting, we make sure husbands sit with your wives. Now they may separate when they're in church, but you know, we're a team. We work together as a team. In the kingdom of God, no man is an island, but we are a team connected to one another. We cannot do it by ourselves. A well-known football manager more commented in, or once commented in an interview, it's easy to get good players, but getting them to play together, that's the hard part. And sometimes that's the way we are in the church. You know, the Lord has called us to do certain things, and then we want to do it our way, but God has another way. And until we get together and become united as a team, we can't move forward. You know, and they say that uh, dependent people need others to get what they want, but independent people can get what they want through their own efforts. Interdependent people, they combine their own efforts and with the efforts of others to achieve the greatest success. And that's what Global Missions is. It's literally a team that where we, they realized many years ago, we cannot do it by ourselves. But if we can get a team, we can get on the same picture, we can get on the same boat, we can get in the same mind frame. Together, we can do a lot. And even, even Mother Teresa said one time, she said that, um, you know, all of us, not all of us can do such great things, but we can do the small things with God's love. If we do the small things, God isn't asking us to do great, big, mighty things. He allows those things to happen. But God, he wants us to do our part, to be fitly joined together in the kingdom of God. And I love it because in missions, you know, we are a team. We depended on you for 40 years, almost 40 years. They, they have on our plaque, it says 40 years. We really did 39 and a half or three quarters. So, you know, but we'll take the 40 years because sometimes it felt like it was 40 years and sometimes it felt like we had just left. But, you know, if we together, we were supported 
And God never, I can tell you, not one time did God ever fail us. I remember the time when we, my husband, uh, on a Saturday morning, Brandon had, our youngest son had had an, uh, a young man come over and was staying with us. And my husband, we'd done breakfast on Saturdays, we always do the big breakfast. And so we had biscuits and gravy, and we had scrambled eggs, and we had uh, sausage, I think it was at that time, that I had made from hamburger meat. And so we had eaten, and, and I was doing the dishes in the, in the kitchen. And my husband came in, and he said, baby, he says, I, I feel an urgency today that we need to pray now. And so, you know, women, we're doing our dishes, we're cleaning up. And I said, well, can I just finish these last few dishes and, and then I'll come in? And he said, finish what you're doing and then come in. Well, he went into our, our uh, what we called our family room. It was really a bedroom with a couch where we prayed. And so he went in with his guitar and he started praying and he started playing. He was, wasn't praying yet, he was playing and singing songs. And so I quickly hurried up and I thought, he said it was urgent, I need to be in there and I need to be praying. And so I walked into the room and there was like, I could not see it, but I felt the presence of God. It was like walking through a veil to get to my prayer place where I was going to pray. And as I began to pray, I could not really speak the words. I mean, it was just, I was just in the presence of God. And I thought, this is a big, urgent prayer. I don't know what it's about. But I began to listen to my husband pray. And as he began to pray, he was saying, God, protect my family. Well, I had heard that so many times being overseas. But he was praying with such an urgency. God, protect my family. Put a hedge round about my family. Don't let any harm come to them today. And after about 45 minutes, the, the, the burden seemed to lift, and we got up. We went about our day, went over to some friend's house. I had made pizza. They loved my American pizza. So I took pizza to their house, and the kids did games, and we fellowshiped with the adults. And as we were coming home, we had gotten a little uh, Rottweiler puppy. And the guards, we had gates and we had the, the wire uh, glass all on top of the, the uh, cement wall that was about eight feet high. And the guards normally open the door or the gate really fast and we zip in. Well, we had not been out that late before. It was about 11 o'clock. And so the guard was not opening the gate. And so I said, well, it's probably because the puppy is trying to get out of the gate. And he said, well, I don't know. And about that time, he rolled his window down. And when he rolled his window down, I'm still looking for the puppy. But the, the young man that was the, with my son, he saw the gun come to my husband's head. And, and all of a sudden, as the gun came, my husband revved the car. They shot the gun. And then... He threw his hands up and he, he, uh, the, the, they shot it again. And I thought they'd shot him then and I screamed. And they stole our car. They got away with a, a three quarters of one of the pizzas that was left. We had put brand new tires on the car that day. Thank God for global missions. And we had just had the air conditioner repaired. And they, they took my purse at gunpoint and, and I was just like, okay, God, this is it. <laughs> I'm done. This is it, Lord. I'm done. I was so afraid. But as I went to the neighbor's house and it, with the children, I talked to God until about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, God, I can't do this anymore. I've got my son. I had somebody else's son. Lord, I'm ready. Has anybody ever been in a situation to where you felt like that you just couldn't do any more for God? that you just felt like you wanted to give up and not do any more. But when God calls you to do something, he puts the stick em to it. He puts that desire within. And as I was laying there and all of a sudden I quit talking and it was like the voice of the Lord said, are you done? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm done because I had told the Lord, I'm ready to go stateside. You just got to tell that man 
that I'm married to, that we, we need to go stateside. This was in 1997. And I was like, I'm ready to go. One son was already stateside. The other one was in high school. And I was just like, God, I'm ready. I, I just, you just need to tell him. And the Lord said, are you done? And I said, yes, sir, I'm done. And he said, think about the call to prayer this morning. When God calls you, don't hesitate. When you feel the urgency to pray, don't hesitate because God knows all things and he knows what's about to happen. He knew, but I had no idea. And I remember that and I began to weep and I said, God, you protected us in such a beautiful way. No one was hurt, only material. Material things can be replaced, but your life cannot be replaced. But when you give it to God, he can do all things. And about three months later, we had snail mail. We didn't have, our computer was a 256 gigabyte, I think, or me megabyte, megabyte. So, you know, we had one of those dot matrix printers that went to, 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 to print out everything. Well, the mail came and there was a letter in the mail and it was dated the day that this thing had taken place. And he said, you don't know me, I don't know you, but he said at such and such a time, which was our time, he said, I got a, such an urgent prayer for God's protection upon you and your family. And I began to pray and I felt after 45 minutes, he said that burden lifted and I knew God was going to protect you. You may not know it, but God will lay you on somebody's heart. And I'm so thankful for global missions. I'm thankful for, for the, the connection, for the team that we have. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We never got the car back. We never got the pizza back. But we were a witness that God had done what he was going to do. And we say in Africa, Pangono, Pangono, Dimitolo. That means little by little, you'll get a bundle. So it doesn't matter what you give. It doesn't matter how much you give, but little by little becomes much when God is in it. And that's a song that we used to sing because God knows everything. He knows all. We can, we can, do, we can do a little bit whenever it's just one of us or two of us. But when we gather together as a team, when we work together as a team, greater things shall ye do than I do, Jesus said to his disciples. And that's for us. Greater things shall we do. I remember there was a lady that came. She had a goiter on her neck. It was huge. I mean, it was probably the size of this bottle out to the side of her neck. She came forward and she came for prayer. And I looked at my husband and my husband looked at me and I thought, okay, God, this isn't me. This isn't my husband. This is because your name says, if we call upon it, you will do what you said you would do. So as we begin to pray, my husband had me lay hands on the goiter and he laid hands on her head and asked as she began, or as we began to pray, and she began to pray, that goiter, I felt it go right down to where there was nothing because God honors his word. He honors the faith that we have in him and greater things shall we do. Hallelujah. I remember Sister Slambert in South Africa. She was 84 years old. Her desire, her family expressed, and she expressed, I need to go to Bible school before I die. She's 84 years old. And I thought, God, love her. She passed it with so many colors. I mean, she was an awesome example. She came to Bible school. She graduated from Bible school, and she waved her diploma, and she said, God, thank you for letting me study your word before I die. And this is my diploma. And we were told not many weeks after that, the Lord took her on to her heavenly home. When you have a desire to do something for God, no devil can stop you. There is nothing that come between you and God unless you yourself allow it. Amen. I am so thankful that together we can do what God, you know, with God, all things are possible. We thank Brother Linder for those six times he came. He started out in a regional conference that was way out 
kind of in the bush, I think. Ant Hills, bigger than he was, taller than he was. And we're so thankful for that. And then he graduated to youth conference two years in a row. And then he was the general conference speaker with Brother Robert for two of those times. And in those six visits, we are so thankful for the um, 231 that received the Holy Ghost. And there were, and I don't have the accurate account because sometimes the baptisms took place after we left, but the accounting that I got during those meetings was 98 were baptized in Jesus' name. As a team, we can exceed our limitations. We are so limited in our flesh, but God is not limited in the spirit. We are not in competition with one another. The North American church is not in competition with the global church, but because of the North American church that gets the burden and desire to give yourself away, to give of yourself, then together we see great, great things happening on the field. Not all are are willing to go as far as physical, and I was that person that didn't want to go, but thank God I yielded to him. And But it, you can may not be able to go in your flesh, but you can go in your finances and you can go in your spirit. Um, I am so thankful that, that during that time we saw hundreds of graduates from our Bible school graduate. In 2014, we nationalized the work. And we have a general superintendent that was the global that was a speaker, I think, at the global mission service in 2021 because we couldn't have it in that um, couldn't be in person, and so he was there. He and his team, I'm proud to say, godly proud. You know, there's levels of pride, and I don't want to be a prideful person in the sense that I'm sinning, but a god, you know, like of our children. You're godly proud of the things your children do. And I'm godly proud that we were able to teach all those on the general board, I think now except for maybe one, our products of the Bible school while we were there in the 40 years. And God, we just got to go back in last year because they did a farewell service for us because we left in uh, 2020, COVID. You all remember that ugly ugly C-O-V-I-D, you know, that was there. Well, we didn't get to have a farewell. Some people thought we were still on the field. We were communicating, but we were not on the field. We were here. And so they honored us last year. And I was so thankful, you know, to see the body of Christ, to see the graduates, to see the ministry. You don't know what your giving has done until you see it there. And one day we say, Sikulina Yesu Alikubera, which means one day Jesus is coming back. Sikulina Tisa Ona Yesu Kumamba. One day we're going to see Jesus in heaven. Sikulina Banjalanga Ndi Ife Yander or Uko. One day our family all over the world, Zikola Ponzi, we will be together, marching together, singing together, worshiping together, doing what God has called us to do. I am so glad to know that I am a part of the family of God. I am so glad to know that God is not a respecter of person, because if God was a respecter of person, I would not be here. If God was a respecter of person, you may not be here, but God sees potential in every single one of us. We are a team working together for the kingdom of God. We are a team working together for souls because Jesus said, I came not to those that are whole, but I came to those that need a physician. He came to seek and to save the lost. And that is our job. That is our duty. That is why we exist as a church. We are so thankful for all that he is doing. We're thankful because God's protection is not limited to us. You know, it's not limited to what we do. Um, Brother Abernathy, when we were living in Malawi, and I'm closing with this, he would go for one week, two weeks to teach at, they called it block teaching. So he would go to 
uh, travel away, so it was just Brandon and I were left at home. Brandon was doing homeschooling. And um, he came back one time, and there was our gardener who serves as a guard. He came to Brother Abernathy, and he said, Pastor, I need to, I need to talk to you, but not with sister. And my husband says, well, whatever you have to say to me, you say it in front of my wife, you know, it, because you're here when I'm gone. So he reached in his pocket, and he had this dirty cloth, and in his hand, he was holding three vials of um, ketamine, and another one that was the um, sodium pentothal. And he had three syringes in his hand in that group. And my husband says, what is this? And he said, well, while you were gone, the thieves came, they gave me this medication, and they said, you have access to their home. So we want you to take the ketamine and put it in the mother, the mai's tea, the mother's tea, and we want you to put the other into the, the men's tea. And when they're asleep, we will come in and just take everything that they have. And he said, but I, I could not do that. I took it because I didn't want them going someplace else. He said, but I want you to know that this is what they have done. And my husband said, brother, or he wasn't brother. He said, Samson, he said, I thank you for that. I thank you for protecting my wife. But you're not only the protector. I know a God that is the protector. I know a God that will keep them. And so we took it to the police station and, and, and they said, well, we can't figure out who it is. But you know what? We don't have to figure out anything because God knows all things. And I can't emphasize that enough. God knows all things. I remember at a, at a, uh, Copper Belt we, or Northern Region, we were at a meeting and there were, it was a pastors and wives meeting and there was a stack of bicycles. I mean, it probably covered maybe from that wall all the way up here, just out the end of the pew. Every pastor was riding a bicycle and their bicycles were there and their ladies had come and, and they had traveled over 200 kilometers to get to that meeting on bicycles. And one of the pastor's wives came to me and she said, Sister Abernathy, I want to enjoy this conference so badly. But she says, my legs are so swollen. And I looked at her legs and they were huge. And I said, why are they so swollen? And she said, well, we rode the bicycle for the 200 kilometers and I sat on the handlebar of the bicycle while my husband was driving. We stopped on the side of the road several nights to sleep so that we could get to the meeting. But my legs are so swollen. And I thought, God, in your faithfulness, God, in her faithfulness, let my faith reach you, Lord, that you will be able to touch this sister so that she can worship the Lord. And so I called my husband over in the ministry and we laid hands on her and began to pray for her. And she started dancing and she started moving. Well, me, brother, I'm looking, Brother Brian, I'm checking the leg. I want to see the leg because I, I wanted to see what God had done. And as I saw her running across, God had completely taken the swelling away. She worshiped the Lord and she was the one that God just honored in, in her faith. So whatever situation you may be in, wherever you are in your walk with God, in your leadership capacity, don't forget you are not alone. You are a team and together much can be accomplished. You know, if, if a person A stands or, or looks out and can't see and person B cannot see either, if person A gets on person B's shoulder, he can see further than person B or anybody else. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. We stand on one another's shoulders because he is the one that knows all things and he can do what we cannot do. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Well, it's not easy to follow something like that. 
You should have let me speak first, honey. Amen. You know, we could tell a lot of stories of the goodness of the Lord. And I know there's many here that could do the same. God is such an awesome God. Such an awesome God. I prayed as a missionary. I said, Lord, a friend of mine was a missionary. In his time, he struck three people with his vehicle over a lot of years, but still, and I prayed, God, you know, it seems like a little thing, but to me it was very serious. Please don't let me hit anybody. I killed ducks and chickens and one goat, but thank God I didn't hit a person. Amen. What I'm saying is, you know, it may not seem like a big thing, but God is concerned about everything in your life, in our life. Hallelujah. I feel such a beautiful spirit here. Amen. And I honor each and every one of you that's here tonight, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Brother Linder, for this opportunity. We love the Linders. They, to us, they feel like family. And uh, I, uh, I thank God for putting people in my life and uh, giving us that opportunity. You know, if you weren't in the church, you wouldn't know the people you know that's sitting here with you. I mean, to me, that's an awesome thing. Brother Brian, I would not, not know you. And you got my brother's name. Or I, my brother's got your name, one or the other. Amen. It's uh, nothing like being in the family of God part of the church last night was awesome I enjoyed that uh, tremendous time and watching everyone fellowship and losing my first bout of throwing that thing uh, thankfully I didn't hit anybody I've done that before I put a man on the floor one day but my first throw of that game but I was careful last night and the food was spectacular. Oh my goodness, ribs. Oh, I just, if you weren't there, I'm sorry to make your saliva move, but it was good. Amen. Thank you, brother and sister Linder, and to this church for the kindness you've already shown us, the basket at the hotel and the food that we've eaten. I had some of the best salmon today that I've ever eaten. And uh, most of all, I've enjoyed the fellowship. Uh, I won't remember your name, but I met a lot of people last night and uh, so kind, making us feel so welcome, and uh, we appreciate that. You know, when we get to heaven, it's going to be an awesome thing. Uh, there are people that you've never seen physically, uh, but I can't help but believe God is some way going to let them know that's one of those that help bring the gospel to you. Amen. And how awesome that's going to be. There's going to be people from South Africa, Malawi, and Zambia that this church has a handprint on their lives. Let me give you a, uh, a little bit of a breakdown. And I'll do this tomorrow too, because uh, I understand who I'm talking to here tonight. We'll be here tomorrow also. Uh, but we know the motto of UPC is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church, which is a pretty cool addition that Brother Haney made. Um, what's happening this weekend is the will of God. And I believe that God is very attentive as to what's going on right here this weekend because this is his purpose. This is what it's all about. He came for the purpose of souls. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Somebody say amen. When we arrived in uh, Zambia, please understand this is not giving us any glory tonight, but I think you need to understand how that God blesses the work and how the work is growing around the world. Uh, let me say Heaven View is an awesome church. This is a church that was on our list of a possibility of place of landing when we retired. I mean, I'm saying that honestly. Uh, I'm not just trying to be nice, but that's true because we were so impressed when we came here. 
And uh, if I lived in this area, there's no question in my mind, we'd go to heaven view. Amen. When we arrived in Zambia, uh, the constituents at that time was 8,041. When we retired, it was 25,000 and more. Amen. Just last year, the constituency was reported at 29,021. When we arrived in Zambia, licensed ministers was at 40. When we retired, it was 214. And 2022, it was 247. When we arrived in Zambia, the preaching points in churches was 95. And when we retired, it was 275. And 2022, last year, 280. God is doing great things. Hallelujah. And you have a part of that. Hallelujah. It's awesome when you see it in that light. Last year, 2022, in Zambia alone, 2,629 were baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Last year in Zambia alone, 2,831 received the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. Amen. And we had 49 graduates from Word of Flame Bible School last year. We have a motto on our wall that says, enter to learn, leave to serve. And truly that's what we practiced Paul said, the things thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And that's what we do as missionaries. Brother Freeman told me when I was first in South Africa, he said, Brother Abernathy, he said, this is a different day than when I came years ago as a missionary because we just went somewhere and preached, started something and left it and went somewhere else. But today, it's all about training of leaders, and the work is becoming more stable and more strong. And uh, I don't know if that's proper English or not, but if it isn't, forgive me. It, it is better today than it had been because of Bible school and training. I'm a, I'm a believer in Bible school. Thank you, Heaven View. What I've just read, you have a part in that. Hallelujah. Amen. And we appreciate all your prayers and all that you've done. I'm going to speak for a few minutes tonight. I think, I think I have 30 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll do my best to stick with that. My wife, she did so good. I'm so proud of her, and thank God for a good wife. Amen. One day I came in the house, and the wind caught the door after that experience she was talking about and slammed, and when it did, I heard her. She slid down the wall and was in a ball just crying and weeping and so scared. But the Lord helped us through that. And she would go back tomorrow if I said, let's go. Amen. Hello. But I, I'm too, I'm, uh, you saw me walk up the steps. So it's probably good for me to stay on this side. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I know I'm speaking to leadership today, and I understand that. And as leaders, I know you are faithful because we don't choose leaders to encourage them to be faithful. We choose leaders that are people that have already proven themselves to be faithful. And I know the pastor has confidence in you and he sees God's hand on your life. And uh, we are in a, in a uh, what we do is serious. This is serious business. Uh, you know, doctors and lawyers deal with natural, physical things of life, but we deal with that which is eternal. We deal with eternal souls. Where someone's going to spend eternity? So what we do in the church is serious. We're not playing games. It's serious business. Every song we sing is serious. Every prayer we pray is serious is serious. Every service is serious. We've got to take it 
to heart to realize this could be a turning point in someone's life that matters eternity for them. God help us to know that. Amen. And uh, that's why, church, that God has called not only reaches Jerusalem, their Jerusalem, but also reaches and sends missionaries, as you have sent my wife and I, to go to the world to preach the gospel to the whole world. God told Jeremiah, he said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto nations. God's plan for your life supersedes all the plans of man. Your potential is determined by God, not man. He has a plan for you laid out even before you were formed. Because God knows the beginning from the ending. But at the same time, you have a part in that. Because you are a free will moral agent. You make your own choice. However, God does have a design for your life. He loves us that much. Your family tree does not interfere with God's plan for your life or potential. Where your history is and your family does not dictate the potential of your future. I'm going to talk about potential a little bit. Potential for a child of God is limitlessness because our God is an infinite God, and He is the one who deals with our potential. I, I look back as a young man in missionary work, and I used to tell younger ministry, I said, don't, don't ever be afraid to step out where God calls you, because I promise you, whatever God calls you to do or leads you to do, he will give you what you need to accomplish that. Don't, you know, we, com we commonly feel like I don't have the ability. No, you don't, but God does. And God's the one that designs your potential. Amen. God called Gideon a mighty man of value even when he was hiding in the wine press. We have to realize God is your source. God is my source. Your potential, my potential, is found in one who is omnipotent, one who is omniscient, one who is omnipresent. I'm telling you, all things are possible through Christ. Hallelujah. How awesome is that when we realize, I'm not doing this alone. If God calls, and I feel the Holy Ghost in that, if God calls us, he's with us. You can accomplish it. Amen. And it's something that we have to understand is that we are being developed by a God who can do anything. Amen. When you talk about uh, potential, you're talking about the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. A quality that's not yet manifest or developed. It's kind of like an artist who looks at a piece of wood and in their mind, they know what they want that to look like, and they start working on it. They have the design in their mind, and the sculpture knows the potential of that raw piece of wood or that raw stone. Or an artist looking at a blank canvas. He's chosen or she's chosen the paint brushes. She's chosen or he's chosen the type of paint. And they see in their mind before they even lay the first stroke of paint on that canvas what they want to see in the final product. John 1.12 said, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. God is not finished with us. He has a plan. He has a design. He's not even finished with this old boy yet. 
There are still some things that maybe he wants to work through my life yet. But I've got to stay on the potter's wheel. I've got to stay pliable to him and let him bring that potential to the surface and use me for his glory, for his honor, for his breath, and for his praise. Amen. As the apostle Paul said, as long as there's breath in this body. I've heard people say, you know, I've gone to church enough in my lifetime. I think when I retire, I'm just going to go seclude myself. What a foolish statement. Should be as long as there's breath in this body. <laughs> That's who I am. That's how I roll. That's what I do. Amen. It'll never change. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. You never get too old to be used by the master. You never get, you're never too young to be used by the master. Hallelujah. He wants to work a good work. He wants to make a trophy, a beautiful painting to show forth his praises and his glory. Amen. The only way we can know the potential that's locked up within us is how much we surrender and say, God, here I am. I give myself to you. I want you to have total control. I remember when I received the Holy Ghost, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. I surrender all to you. I'll do what you want me to do. How many remember those commitments to God? Hallelujah. God's always looking for availability. A lot of people, you know, they have so much ability. They, you know, I, I, I teasingly say that person makes me sick. You know? <laughs> Sorry, Brother Brian, when I see these musicians like the one I was talking to you about plays guitar and every instrument under the sun and I, I beat around on a guitar, I think, you know what, you just make me sick. <laughs> Amen. But again... What you are lacking, God will make up the difference. And not only that, the beautiful thing about a team is where your shortfalls is, you can bring some, ah, whoo, you can bring that person up beside you who makes the difference, who that is their specialty. Hallelujah. And you know what? Who cares who gets the glory as long as you give it to Jesus? That's the one that deserves it all. Hallelujah. But as leaders, you know, we, we can't be lazy. We must be students. We study, we prepare, we prepare, we prepare, we prepare. We sharpen our abilities. We pray, we pray some more, and we pray some more. <clears throat> you know, sometimes... I think it's good if we just remind ourselves and realize that our walk with God is a relationship. It's a lifestyle. Every leader should desire to walk in his spirit. Paul said, in him we live, we move, we have our being. And then it goes on and says, for we are also his offspring. I, I see and you see many times people that are used of God greatly. And sometimes they haven't been in the church very long. And we wonder, how in the world? You know, I've been in the church for 10 years. And that guy, that, or that lady's only been in the church for five years. And look at Look at what she's doing in the church and in the kingdom of God. I don't understand that. How can that be? First of all, we never compare ourselves with ourselves. That's not wise. We also have to realize every individual is there. They're a different part of the body and the kingdom of God. And if I want to be honest, which I do, 
more than likely a lot of times the reason is because of their willingness to stay on the sacrificial altar of surrender and servitude. They say, God, here I am. Like the man, the king that got up on that altar that was the same size as the brazen altar. He put himself on that altar as a sacrifice and gave glory to God. And this presence of God came and so mightily at that place. Why? Because he sacrificed himself, not literally, but in a figurative way to the Lord. God, help us to dedicate ourselves to the things of God. I promise you, when we put it all on the altar, we give God the liberty to use us and to move mightily amongst us. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It's a dying out daily. Not just on Sunday or I don't know when your midweek service is, Wednesday or Thursday, but daily. It's a crucifying of the flesh. And I know I'm talking to the choir, but sometimes it's good for memory to be shaken a little to remember. I want to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. I want God to be able to talk to me and to move me. I, I don't care if anybody knows. Uh, you know, I don't, want to see, I don't even want to see an angel. But if I saw an angel, I doubt if I would ever say I saw an angel. Because it's not about me, but it's about my relationship with God. You, I, I hope you just get what I'm saying there. God help us. I'm not just doing enough to get by. I heard someone say recently in preaching, which was really pretty awesome. In fact, it was an evangelist at our church he said, you know, when you marry a girl, you don't ask her, what's the minimum time that I can spend with you that we can make this work? You know, what's the least I can give in my marriage so that we can still, you know, that would be, that, that she would have told me to pack my bags and go to, no, I would never have done it. <laughs> Amen. But you know, sometimes it's like we do that to God. I want to be used, God, but what's the minimum? No, 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 no. He gave his all on the cross of Calvary. What can I do? What can I do but give my all back to him? He deserves my best. <laughs> I surrender all. Ten spies, it's kind of a, a sad story, but they were limited by their own self-perception of themselves. They said, in our own sight, we were grasshoppers. Well, now how silly is that? I mean, really. And because of that, to the enemies, they were also grasshoppers. You know, the devil, he's, he's not ignorant, but also we're not ignorant about his devices either. But our own perception of ourselves as they had can limit our potential sometimes. You see, they forgot God was in that factor. God was in that equation. God was in that picture. But because of their own perception, their carcasses was left in the wilderness because of unbelief. What could God do in heaven view if everyone would exercise faith that God can do anything. There's nothing, no weapon formed, nothing that can hinder the work of God in Winston-Salem. It is the will of God. Revival is here. Revival is happening. God's going to do it. God is doing it, and I want to be a part of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's will was for them to possess the land that he had promised to Abraham. And God's will for this church is to seize your potential in Christ and do all that God has planned for heaven view. Somebody say amen. amen. The door is open. The way is already laid. God has a plan. It's time for us to rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost and through faith to witness what God wants to accomplish in this city. The work is not done yet. 
Yes, you've gone to two services. Well, you could go to three. You could go to three. And in the meantime, God's got a piece of property somewhere ready just for the right time. It's going to happen in Jesus. Hilobos. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to possess this land for Jesus. We're going to fulfill his promise. Are you hearing me? It's no time to sit back and say, well, we've gone to two services. We've done our due deed. No, no, no. There's still souls that are bound for a devil's hell. Somebody has to reach them. He has promised upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've heard too many testimonies of God giving churches churches, God giving congregations land, God paying off mortgages. Let me tell you, God is still the same today as he's always been. We just need to have faith. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I don't understand Honey, did you drink out of this? <laughs> if you would have, it would have been sweeter. Thank you very much. You know, I don't understand in the day we live how the people can be fearful to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And we're in a dangerous day. America, that's always been known as a Christian nation, there's an attack against churches and Christianity today. But that's the enemy. Amen. Let, read the book of Acts. They didn't have a, a skip through the flowers, or I forget, I don't know how to say that. They didn't have an easy road. You hearing me? I preached for years in Africa. I said, you know what? There may come a day when we're persecuted for this truth. And if we are, there's going to be a shaking, and the men will be separated from the boys and the women from the ladies. I mean, girls. Now, I don't mean that negative because there'll be boys and girls. But what I'm saying is that which is those that are truly sold out to God will stand no matter what comes their way because they know greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The devil's a liar and a father of all lies. I believe today's the greatest potential for the church. I believe that. Because we live in a world of fear. People don't know what tomorrow holds. And here we are with a message that brings direction and hope to a hopeless world. I don't preach UPC. I love UPC. I told them in Zambia, if you cut me, I bleed UPC. I wanted them to know, don't talk about UPC because that's who I'm a part of. But I also said if they ever change this message, I will send my card into headquarters thanking them for the time I've been with them. But I will not forsake the truth because only truth is what makes a difference in our world. Hallelujah. But we preach Christ. We preach Christ. I don't wear a Christ on my uh, I don't even have a necklace. I don't wear a necklace. But I don't have a, a, a Christ in my car because he's not on the cross anymore. Amen. But let me tell you, the truth is what still makes people free. How can we be afraid to preach the gospel of Christ? We're not grasshoppers. We're not nobody. We're a chosen generation. I said, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. He called you out so that you could show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There was a time in the past when we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. We didn't have mercy, but now we have mercy. 
We know we're in the will of God, leaders. We know we are. So we cannot ever be ashamed of who we are and who we serve and the power of the gospel of Christ. We can't come to a service, not one service, thinking it's just another service. When there's potential in every service for another day of Pentecost. Leadership's response in church services, that's key to bring a great wave of the Spirit, a great wave of faith, a great wave of conviction. People's eyes are on the leadership of heaven view. Don't ever be a bump on the log. You are lively stones. You are not dead stones. We are not spectators. We are participants. God help us to know God is working today, here, now. Imagine we have a big group here. This is a church, the leadership. If all of you came to service, and I don't, I'm not saying you're not, please don't, don't take out of context what I'm saying here today. I, I, I told you we would have come here, except for my children and my grandchildren. We'd have probably, this is one place we had on, on our heart. And uh, I'm not going where they're dead. You can forget that. Amen. But imagine if you come into this church and every leader has come from a fresh prayer meeting on fire. They have walked through those doors, not one, not two, but every leader full of faith, full of expectation, scattered throughout the pews of the sanctuary, spirit and faith moving, expectation in the house, excitement about what God is going to do in this service. True worship would break through in spirit and truth would be taking place. I tell you what, it can be another building shaking experience because Jesus still inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, yes. While we're in service, God's working on someone's heart. And I'm, I'm really seriously tuned into the church service. But at the same time, I'm saying, God, draw someone by your spirit. Touch a heart in this place today. Move on someone here today. Hallelujah. On the day of Pentecost, they were in one mind, one place, one accord. Leaders, it's time for us to enter those doors, one place, one mind, one accord, and see what God can do. Not sitting back, checking our texts and our email. Remember, people are watching, but we're on the edge of our seat. You know, some people go to a ball game more excited than they come to the house of God. God forbid. God forbid. Sitting on the edge of our seat and when the man of God gets up to bring the anointed word of God, there's an amen over here. There's a hallelujah over here. There's a yes over here. Genuine spirit felt excitement about what he is preaching or she is preaching. What are we doing? We're building faith where spirit is moving. The word is touching someone. Amen. Visitors are feeling something they had never felt before. You and I have not reached our full potential of what God can do through us. We are lacking conviction in the house many times. And I think sometimes we lack that conviction, conviction because of fear sometimes. And I know we have to be wise. We can't get up and say things like we did when I was young that probably, who knows? I'm not even going to guess what they would do. And I'm not fearful, but he that one of the soul is wise. And we can't help people if we drive them out, but neither 
can we water down the Word of God? Because only the Word can bring conviction. The Spirit can bring conviction. I am of the frame of mind that if there's something we need to pray for is God bring conviction in our church services where sinners will come down to an altar with tears running down their face and realizing I'm a sinner and I need God. When the altar call is given, the pastor is not pulling my teeth trying to get people to come down, but altar workers have already made their way down and they're already come on down to the altar and we're going to connect you with Jesus. Jesus is going to change your life. You know, I've always enjoyed working around the altar. At my age and my skinniness, I can't seem to do what I used to do because I, I'm short on breath and my back gives me some hiccups, but in Jesus' name, I'm gonna overcome that, amen. amen. But the point I'm saying is leadership, we're in a battle, a spiritual battle. When someone comes down to the altar, it's heaven or hell. Oh, God, help us to realize this could be their last opportunity. We've got to determine, I'm going to get them connected to God. I'm going to let my faith touch this area. I'm going to believe God, and I'm going to lead them through prayer. That's it. Come on. Believe God right now. Jesus is here right now. You're feeling the Holy Ghost right now. Come on. Jesus is here right now. Worship him. Praise him. Saints of God, it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle, but somebody's got to be willing to fight the battle and stay until somebody breaks through in the Holy Ghost. Let me say to the leaders, we could talk a long time about that altar work business. But let me say to you, if you've never been trained to work in an altar, you need to go to your pastor and say, Pastor, let me get in a class. Teach me how to work the altar. I want to pray for so somebody prayed for me. Somebody interceded for me. Freely we have received. Freely we've got to be willing to give. That instruction is given to come down to the altar. Oh, my goodness. Holy Ghost moving. Six people receive the Holy Ghost. Twelve people receive the Holy Ghost. Thirty-five receive the Holy Ghost. A hundred receive the Holy Ghost. Brother Abernathy, wait a minute. You've gone crazy. This is Winston-Salem. It's not Africa. It's not happened like that here before, and it may have. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stranger here tonight. Not really a stranger. I'm your brother, but I'm not sure what's happened in the past. God knows. Wait a minute. Are you telling me God is different here than he is in Africa? Are you telling me potential is different here than it is in Africa? Are you telling me souls are different here than they are in Africa? It's time for faith to rise and believe in Jesus' name that it can happen here. But now, here's the situation. You can't have 35 receive the Holy Ghost if only one is here that needs the Holy Ghost. Preacher, you're always hammering on us. I call them panel beaters, you know. You're always beating on us, you know. And I know he does, and I know him. We had one in Cape Town. We called him the panel beater because he really panel beaded people. Did I squirrel there? I might have squirreled. Amen. Sometimes the pastor has to preach to the audience he has. You don't preach baptism to a congregation where they're all baptized. You don't preach Holy Ghost to a congregation who all has the Holy Ghost. 
Now, please understand, I am talking leaders. You know, you're, you're, you're supposed to be of meat and be able to take this tonight. Amen. Holy Ghost fire prayer is needed. And God then will give us the opportunity to be sensitive to his spirit and lead us to hungry souls. He'll do it. He always has. He always will. That fire gives us faith and ability and words to be a wise soul winner. People can be driving by when we are where we need to be in the Holy Ghost and say, I just felt led of God to come into this place. Brother A, they said in Cobway at a regional conference, you see those two men right there? I said, yes, I do. They were walking down the street and felt compelled to come in here. Both of them have just received the Holy Ghost. Hey. Hey. Brother Abernathy, a drunk was in a bar near our church, and as he left the bar, he felt compelled to come into our church. And guess what? He's received the Holy Ghost. No longer drunk on liquor, but drunk on the Holy Ghost. We're going to baptize him in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus wants to do. But souls must become a priority. We got to wake up in the morning saying, God, lead me to a hungry soul today. We got to go through the day, souls. We got to lay our head down at night, souls. Oh, God, give me a burden. And let me tell you, if you've got the Holy Ghost, you should have a burden for souls. Got to teach a Bible study because it still works. We're going to pray. We're going to share. We're going to pray. We're going to share. Share some more until that soul comes to church. I see them at an altar of repentance and baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now I'm talking about just the basics of a Christian. That's how we roll as a Christian. But Brother Abernathy, you don't understand. Every, every friend I got goes to church somewhere, and they're good people. Yeah, Cornelius was a good person too. Except a man is born again of water and spirit, he can never see or enter the kingdom of God. Leaders, we cannot become fearful of offending people. I'm saying you have to be wise. Don't be foolish. I can't be foolish. I don't cast stones at their church or their experience. Thank God you've repented. Thank God you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to know there's more for you. There's more for you. But you know what? I, I would rather offend someone into heaven than let them go to hell with at least try, without trying to reach them. Are you happy for your experience in God? Are you happy? Pastors, why don't we see more signs and wonders? And I am about to end, I promise you. Why don't we see more signs and miracles? You know, I, I will be careful, Brother Linder. I'm not in Africa. It's not my church, but we have to be very careful lest we are looking for that which is sensational, spectacular. Isn't God spectacular enough for us? Isn't his word that's quick and powerful, spectacular enough for us? He sent his word and it healed somebody. I tell them, well, read the scripture. They went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So the key is, if we want signs and wonders, we got to go and preach. We got to go everywhere and preach. I tell you, the greatest miracle, I want you to hear this missionary, the greatest miracle is not healing physically. But you should have seen Benny Hinn. <laughs> If you're, if you're a proponent of Benny Hinn, we'll talk after church with your pastor. Your leader's here, so I can, I, would, I'm, may not, I might say this on a Sunday, but for sure, I, I feel safe here tonight. I think you understand what I'm saying. I had a relative 
cancer, liver, dying. And his wife said, Benny Hinn's in town. This was an apostolic preacher, Brother Linder. Benny Hinn's in town. Let's go. He, she, he looked at her and said, Woman, have you lost your mind? I was so happy. I said, Amen. You can go in the rapture with one leg. No leg. But when you're changed to be like him, you will be healed. Are you hearing me? You can go in the rapture blind into one eye and can't see out the other. When you get there, you will see as he sees. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we get so excited, and rightly so, but that's a byproduct. That's not the miracle above all miracles. Physical healing is great. My wife talked about it. It's awesome. Had a lady in a village one day. We went there to teach one of those Bible school classes in Zambia out in the bush. Slept in the tent for two weeks. Took a shower. I probably won't say this at church tomorrow. Took a shower in a grass bamboo area. Cracks. And I'm looking through in my birthday suit. I think everybody knows what that means. Don't get a visual picture of it, please. And I'm thinking, if I can see that lady that's walking down that path, perhaps she can see this albino hippo standing on this rock taking a bath. That's just some experiences that we laugh about today. Might not have been so funny then. But anyway, this lady was coughing. I mean, it was like her lot in life. She learned her. She coughing, coughing, coughing. Well, tuberculosis is terrible. And so I talked to Brother Daka, who was there. I said, Brother Doc, I, you know, it sounds like she may have tuberculosis. He said, I think you're right. And I said, I, I, I think we need to send her to the clinic and be checked, and I'll pay for that. So we called her over and said, I'm going to give you money. How much? Blah, 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 blah. Here's your money. Go tomorrow. Come back with a note from the doctor, clear or not clear. If you're not clear, stay home. And so, uh, but I said, before you go, we're going to pray. And so we prayed, and she left. The next day, she was on the mud pew, no coughing. She was healed. And guess what? I never got the money back. <laughs> Thank you very much, missionary. Thank goodness that didn't catch on in that church, and I was giving everybody money. Just cough, and the missionary will give you money. Amen. So I do believe in physical healing, but what I'm saying is the greatest miracle that even all heaven rejoices is when a, repent, or a person comes to an altar and repents. If heaven rejoices, church, we should rejoice. The greatest miracle is when the pastor or leader buries someone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. I tell you, that's a miracle. <laughs> greatest miracle is when somebody receives the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. That is the miracle above all miracles. That's why Jesus came, that they would be set apart from this world, that he could make a new creation out of them. They would be born of the water and the spirit. I tell you today, church, let's not get it mixed up. Let's realize that's above everything else. And I'm closing with this. Last thought, that's one of the first travails, that children would be born. But the church has a second travail, and that is that Christ would be formed in them. We don't want a revolving door where they come in and go out. We want them to stay. He said that your fruit would remain. 
church leaders, we've got a responsibility to keep them. The devil's after them. As soon as they come to church, they talk to their friends. They say, oh, that church is of the devil. They think they're the only one going to heaven. They think they're the only one saved. Let God be true and every man a liar. Truth is truth. But as the devil attacks them, somebody needs to come around them and say, wait a minute, let's sit down and talk a little while here. I'm praying for you. I'm reaching for you. I'll pick you up for church. Maybe we can do lunch. Maybe we can go, go to Starbucks and have a coffee. Whatever it takes to save a soul. Not like a lady told me in Zambia or Malawi. My brother is a priest. I'm safe to say that, right? My brother is a priest. He will go into a bar and sit down by a drinker and have a beer with them to witness to them because he loves them so much. I said, are you saying that Jesus would have laid with a prostitute to show his love for the prostitute? How silly is that? Sin is sin. Oh, that's tough. Well, I was in Africa. We can be a little tougher over there. Because they know we love them. When people know you love them and you have compassion for their soul, there is walls that will fall down and barriers that will go away because they know I'm only out for what's good for you. And Jesus is only out to lift you up out of a miry pit of sin and put you on a path to that holy city, New Jerusalem. Let's stand tonight. I'm sorry, I took 15 minutes longer than I should have. Everyone say potential. You have potential not to take too much time when the pastor asks you to speak. I'm sorry, I already blew that. God bless you. You know, I look out here and I see such a vast number of leaders and potential that's in this place. And God knows where you are and God knows your ability. You're not here by accident. You're here in the will of God. I challenge you, stay on the altar. Stay surrendered to him. Be sensitive to the leading of his spirit. You know what? God could get, give on your heart tonight somebody that needs a call tonight that could come to church tomorrow and receive the Holy Ghost tomorrow. How many wants to be used of God? How many is willing to sacrifice and give of yourself? It's the will of God. Heaven view, it's the will of God. You have a great pastor and pastor's wife. You have tremendous leadership. You have a beautiful sanctuary. There's no reason to be ashamed to invite someone into God's house. And guess what? We're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's still the power of God under salvation. Let's raise our hands and thank the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Well, let's thank the Lord for what we have heard today and let us surrender to this word. Let's thank the Lord for what we have heard today and let's surrender to what God is doing in our hearts today. Oh, my God.
presence of the Lord is here in such a beautiful way and we have heard from God so powerfully thank you so much brother and sister Abernathy thank you for letting God speak to you and through you for us thank you to this great congregation of leaders for yielding to the spirit of God and hearing the voice of God today obviously tomorrow uh, in the 9.30 service or the noon service, whichever one is best for your family, you're welcome to come to both. They'll have two different speakers in each, each service. I think Sister Abernathy will speak in the morning, Brother Abernathy in the afternoon. But you'll be asked to make a monthly commitment as we always do, uh, just whatever you feel you can give to missions on that first Sunday of the month. And then of course, a one-time offering for missions between now and the end of May. That's what we're doing tomorrow, but I, I feel in this atmosphere, it's so much bigger than even a, a number you would write on a card. More than anything, we need to be sensitive to the voice of God and still have within our heart that willingness to say, I give myself to you, I surrender all. I want to be a part of your will in these last days and I want to reach my full potential in the kingdom of God. And so just as a demonstration of what that's gonna look like tomorrow, I am aware of the time, we're not gonna take a lot of time with this, but as we sing again, is there anybody that could come and before you even think about giving money, you could raise your hands at this altar and say, I give myself to you, Lord. I give myself to you, Lord. Anybody that can come, would you come right now and lift your hands and lift your voice and say, I surrender to you, Lord. I surrender to you. Make me more sensitive. Help me to tap into the potential that you have for me. Help me, Lord, to be yielded to your spirit in every detail of my life. Please come if you can. And if you are willing, come close and don't be distracted and lift your heart, lift your hands, lift your voice out and say, this prayer is a prayer of surrender. This prayer is a prayer of surrender. I surrender to you, Lord. I surrender.
could you pray withholding nothing I give myself to you withholding nothing could you say those words withholding nothing I give myself to you withholding nothing I say yes to you God I'm not here to bargain with you I'm here to put myself on the altar I'm not here to negotiate a contract with you I put myself on the altar I'm not here Lord to make a few promises and see how it turns out I put myself on the altar today Jesus Christ, what a wonderful response, what a powerful atmosphere, what a beautiful word from God. Recently, this past week, I've asked leaders to input into our church ways that we can be better. The response has been so beautiful, probably nearly 25 leaders that have contributed, and I will say this without exception. There, on every single one of those responses, there's at least one idea that would make us a better church. On Not without exception, at least one idea. I'd say, wow, that's going to help us. Not every idea, but at least one on every page. Thank God for leaders that want us to grow. But I want you to think about this with all of those good ideas. What we heard tonight... What we heard tonight, if you take all of those good ideas, that's the icing. Tonight we heard the cake. And if you don't buy into that, you are deceived into thinking that there's another idea besides commitment and sacrifice and expectation that's going to take us to the next level. None of those ideas are going to take the place of what we heard tonight. When I was a teenager, I would walk down Fifth Avenue at Christmas time, and I'd look at the window displays at Christmas, and they were so spectacular, ooing and eyeing. I was just captivated. But I will tell you, none of those window displays, with all of their spectacular dressing, really made a difference to me because I couldn't afford anything that was inside of those stores. I couldn't afford anything. And all the ideas we have as leaders to make this church grow, if we're not willing to pay the price for what's inside, what we heard, to, it's just window dressing. 
I'm begging us as a church, the commitment that you have made over and over again. I'm not talking about a faith promise card. I'm talking about giving yourself to the Lord. I'm just saying, would you raise your hands and say, God, I have not served you long enough to excuse myself from giving myself away one more time. I don't have enough years invested in the work of God and in the things of God to say, well, I've already done my part and now it's time for someone else to do their part. None of that is what God is asking for right now. He's saying, Jesus, I give myself to you. I give myself to you. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. I want to move forward. I want to see us capture this city, Lord. Capture this city, Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Who is this God that says the reward for sacrifice is more sacrifice? He's the God that's already seen the reward that he has for us. And he's saying just one more step, one more mile, one more mountain, one more battle, and the victory is going to be worth it. Is there anybody that would say, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my future. I trust trust you with my my ministry I say yes to you Lord I say yes to you Lord Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Could you use your voice now and with your hands raised, just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for calling me. Thank you, Lord, for using us. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for taking my life as an offering, as a sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for it, God. I love you for it, God. I love you for it, God. I love you for it, God. Hallelujah. I got a lava, sick, a lava higher. You love my sick, a lava higher.
doing it, God. Thank you for your promise, God. Thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for directing your church, oh God. Thank you for giving us, God, your strength, your presence, your word, your promise, your power, oh God. God, ekale kasata le katia le ilobotika le mande gotika le ilama yeka ye matole katika le. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you appreciate Brother and Sister Abernathy and their beautiful ministry? Wow. Praise God. It is so awesome to sense that commitment over so many years and then what flows from that. It, you have blessed us. You have transmitted something to us. And I am not surprised. I'm grateful. Love these folks so much. And even tonight, I'm renewed and reminded of how many times you have encouraged and inspired me to want to do more for God. I thank God for what we've heard tonight. Amen. Thank you, each of you, for being here and also for your commitment. Just so you can be fully aware, the way the service is uh, designed tomorrow, obviously, we will make these commitments but come altar time, we want God to have his way. So there's still time for you to text or email, invite somebody. I can tell you right now, if you bring a guest, we're not going to pressure them to fill out a card, but we're going to make sure they know it's not all about these cards tomorrow. Does that make sense? We've had several services in a row where God has been moving in people's lives. Let's not miss that tomorrow. So at the end of both services, would you let your expectation level rise? Yes, I'm going to commit. Yes, I'm going to invest. But let's see what God's going to do to heal, to help, to save, to deliver. Be a great day for somebody to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. A great day for somebody to be baptized in Jesus' name. Praise God. And I believe these cards speak a lot of our commitment to what God has called us to be as a church. But there are great miracles God will do tomorrow if we come expecting, expecting, expecting. God will do the, the, bed, the rest. Oh, help me, Jesus. I'm sorry we're about 11 minutes late, but it's not his fault. I took about 10 minutes in the beginning. So I want you to get around. Make sure you let them know how much you love them. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. The building has been closed.